now that we understand communism and what it is a little better, we can talk about why did we even have a Cold War. Okay, so now there's a, a chart that I, I will attach to this lecture to help you, that you'll use this PowerPoint to fill in the front half of that chart, the who's, what's, when, where's, and why's. And we'll flip it over and we'll do a separate lecture on containment for you to fill in that half as well. So, why in the world did we have a Cold War? Let's set the stage a little bit here. A little bit of review from last time, but important stuff for us to go over again. So, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies during World War II. Okay, but both sides will spy on each other heavily during that time period as well. The Soviets with much better results than us. We have not been the best spies, uh, and they were pretty good at it. It's part of the reason they got the nuclear bomb so quickly after we created it. Now, both wanted to share as little as possible in the victory over the Axis powers, which means land, glory, resources, and economic opportunities. Okay, we wanted to share as little of that as possible. Remember we talked about... Uh, the atomic bombs that were dropped, we dropped them specifically on certain days because we wanted to have the war over before the Russians could enter the war, right? We don't want to split with them. They don't want to split with us. And as we talked about last time, communism will be spreading. Stalin's going to take over Eastern Europe with the Iron Curtain thing that we talked about a little bit. Mao Zedong will take over in China. The, the communists win their revolution there in North Korea and in Vietnam following that. So, picture of the Iron Curtain here is similar to the one I showed you in the Communism lecture as well. Uh, but to the right okay, is the Communist countries, and to the left of that red line will be the non-Communist countries. So, the five W's and how. What was it and who fought it? What was it was hostility between post-World War II superpowers. Okay, it's communism versus capitalism. That's the what. right? It's a com competition between these two different social, political, and economic systems, communism and capitalism, to see which one is going to reign supreme. So who fought it? It's going to be the United States, the free world, so the U.S. and its allies versus the Soviet Union, the USSR, and its communist allies. So that's what you put in that box. It's going to last about 45 years. It goes all the way up until the 90s. Why we call it a Cold War is that we are not going to fight the Soviets. We will not directly fight each other during this Cold War. Our proxies will fight. There will be a lot of bloodshed in the name of stopping capitalism or the name of spreading, or, or start, the name of stopping communism or spreading capitalism or vice versa. There will be a lot of blood spilled, but it will not be the United States shooting at Soviets or Soviets shooting at Americans. So, there's the USSR on a map. It's always important to note that Russia... The Soviet Union at this point is freaking humongous. Okay, now the Soviet Union will lose some. I'm going to stand up for a second so you get to see a bit of me. A large chunk here will go away when the Soviet Union falls apart. Okay, those communist countries on the, on the, so be the western part of the Soviet Union, but on the, in Eastern Europe, will eventually uh, get their independence. But Russia is huge. Okay, it's hard to overstate how big of a country that is. All right, so where was the Cold War fought? The answer there is everywhere. Wherever we felt communism threatened the world, the Cold War will be fought. It will be fought here in America through things like the House on American Activities uh, Committee and the Smith Act. It will be fought in Asia, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, um, two countries we never declare war on but really do bomb intensely. It will be fought in the Caribbean and Cuba. It will be fought all over Latin America and Central and Southern America in places like Chile uh, in Nicaragua and El Salvador and the Dominican Republic, all over the place. So wherever communism or we thought communism threatened the world. So how was it fought? The how here is a lot. So when you're doing your chart at home, you're just writing in the bold stuff that's in red because there's going to be a lot of bullet points here. So first one is the arms race, okay, which is literally building up weapons. So each side wanted to build up more and more and more weapons than the other side has. Okay, and, and, and because this is now the nuclear age, both sides wants to have more nukes, more atomic weapons than the other side. So in 49, the Soviets achieved their first atomic explosion, and the technology is going to, on both sides, it's going to push both of us to advance. Okay, and by advance I mean make them stronger, so increase their destructive power, make more of them, so increase the numbers, and create new ways to deliver them. So, 
we have submarines that can shoot nukes now from under from under the water, from over the water, uh, from if they come up to the top or from below. Okay, obviously we have bombers. We will create new types of missiles, hypersonic missiles, and stuff like that. What this gets into as well, okay, as you see, the goal here is to maintain a balance of power or, if possible, to gain the advantage. Both sides want to have more than the other side, but they at least want to have as many. And all this arms race stuff circles into what's in parentheses there, mutually assured destruction, the MAD theory. That's the idea that, at this point, okay, forget about being back in history right now, 2020, 10 nuclear weapons at the power that we have will destroy the entire world. It will cover the sky with ash clouds, it'll block out the sun, everything will die. Because we know that, and because we know who else has nukes, we have this idea that if a, a war starts with nukes, then it's all over. And because everybody knows that, maybe we don't have another world war. That's the idea of mutually assured destruction. All right, the next bullet point you write down is a, uh, is a race for world influence. And basically what this means is we want to have more friends than they have friends. We want to outnumber them. They want to outnumber us. This is part of our goal of containment. If we surround the communist countries with non-communist countries, then the communism can't spill out. And they want to do the opposite to us. Next big one will be the space race. I know that's not in red, but you need to write that down, the space race. So the Soviets will launch the first satellite, the Sputnik in 57, which is a huge Soviet victory. They'll put the first person into orbit. But we'll have the first person that does a full orbit of, of the Earth. We'll get to the moon first after we invest a whole lot more money. So we'll eventually win this space race. But it's important to note. All sorts of crazy ideas came out of this. One of the big reasons we wanted to get to the moon first is we were afraid the Soviets would put a nuke on the moon and shoot it at us, like the Death Star or something from Star Wars. Uh, so it was very important for us to get there. And we eventually will. Next big one will be sports and movies. Again, I know it's not in red, but write down sports and movies. The Olympic Games will serve as a Cold War battlefield. And by that, what I mean is, literally in physical competition, we said... Us free countries, the United States, capitalism, democracy, our stuff is better than yours, and we're going to prove that because we're going to be better athletes. On the other side, the communists want to prove the same thing. So these games, these, these events we have against each other in the Olympics become very, 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 very important. And it's more than just sports. It's a way to prove that our way of life is better than their way of life. So there'll be some big, notorious examples. Because I'm a basketball coach, I always include this one, the 1972 Olympic basketball. We are still sending college kids. Every other country sent pros. The Soviet Union was the only other country that could produce pros that were as good as our college kids. So we run up into them in the championship. Now, we're eventually up 50 to 49. Uh, long story short is we, they get three attempts to get the ball in bounds. through a whole bunch of different, said they call a timeout, maybe they didn't, this or that, blah, 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 blah. But on the third and final attempt, they make the layup. They call that the game. They win gold. We win silver. We have never accepted that silver medal. As you can see in this picture on the bottom right, uh, where we're supposed to be standing, there's nobody. We have still never accepted that silver medal. And uh, I would imagine we never accept it. On to better notes, when America wins. In 1980, uh, we went up against the Soviet uh, hockey team. The Soviet hockey team was insanely good. They had basically won every Olympics post-World War II in hockey. Okay? We had a bunch of college kids, again. But we are going to go up against the Soviets in the semifinals, and we pull a uh, crazy victory, a huge surprise upset victory. They call it the Miracle on Ice. There's a movie about it called Miracle. Um, it was seen as more than a hockey game, and it's considered one of the greatest sports moments in U.S. history. So there's a win for us, right? We lose the Olympics in 72 in, in basketball, but we win it in 80 in hockey. All right, so sports and movies. Movie stuff, okay? Uh, again, I'd like to caution this, and we'll talk about it in many different instances or whatever, but when you watch movies, when you watch television shows, even if it's just supposed to be entertainment, they still serve a propaganda-like purpose, Right? Pay attention to who the good guys are. Pay attention to who the bad guys are, especially in terms of ethnicity or where they're from. Um, so, for the entire Cold War, we use movies 
to prove that the Soviets were bad people, that they were cold and ruthless. If you look back from about 1950 until about 1990, the bad guys in all these action movies, the bad guys in all these shows, happen to have an Eastern European accent and believe in communism. On the other side, if you were to live in the communist world, their shows portrayed Americans as spoiled and undisciplined, and that we were the bad guys and that a good Soviet would have to come and save the day. So the goal here is that we want to prove our mental or moral superiority over them and vice versa. And we're going to try to do that through movies, reinforcing that in the people's minds. So some examples, Rocky IV, Rocky versus the Russian, okay, is a big one. The Manchurian Candidate is a movie about uh, a Russian spy okay, like, uh, that eventually becomes an American president and doesn't know he's a spy until someone says a key word to him and then he remembers all of his training. And of course, the, the uh, English will get on this, the Europeans will get on this as well, as you can see there, a James Bond movie from Russia with love. All right, so why did the United States eventually win the Cold War? A lot of people say we outspent the Soviets, and there's some truth to that. But the biggest thing was that the Soviet system, okay, the Soviets propping up a whole bunch of other countries, was not able to adapt fast enough. Okay? The Chinese are still technically a communist country, but they adapted their economic system. They have private ownership there. They have other things that don't fit the communist mold, and they're able to survive. They're a world superpower right now with us. The Soviet Union was not able to do that. Okay, so in the long run, the weaker communist system could not keep up the race, and there will be economic collapse. Okay? The Soviet economic system in Eastern Europe wasn't working entirely well. The economics, economies weren't growing as well as they needed to. And there will be a large quality and technology gap between communist and capitalist world systems. This does not exactly extend over everything. Okay? The Soviet military technology will be pretty advanced. Not quite as far as ours, but really close. But they'll have to focus so much more on that than we have to focus here. Okay? And a big reason for that, as I'm, what I'm trying to get to, is that they're going to focus a huge percentage of what they're creating on military stuff. Then another huge percentage has got to go to all these countries that they just took over and made communist, all the Eastern Bloc, the Cubans that they're supporting, the uh, African nations that they're supporting, the Eastern Asian countries that they're supporting. So they don't have as much to focus on the quality and technology of day-to-day -day life, the quality and technology of their information and um, uh, electrical grid. They're going to start dabbling in, in uh, nuclear technology for um, power, and that's not going to work out very well if you've ever heard of Chernobyl. Uh, so in the bottom line, at the end of this, like I said before, the Soviets could not adapt or adjust their system quickly enough. This guy here on the bottom right, Mikhail Gorbachev, will become the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, and he'll introduce a whole lot of democratic and economic reforms, but it's too little too late. And in 1991, the Soviet Union will collapse, so the United States will officially win the Cold War. All right, that is it for uh, why a Cold War. Okay, you should have that sheet. I'll attach everything on the back. We'll do containment, and that'll be a separate video so that they're smaller and easier to download.